Mm, hello everyone. How is everyone doing today? I hope you're all ready for yet another um, installment in the NixOS 2020, sorry, not NixOS, Summer of Nix 2022 Public Lecture Series. I'm never going to get used to pronouncing that fully. Um, but yeah, I hope you're ready for another one. But before we get started, of course, the usual, I'd like to thank the people that make it possible. And I also like to accentuate this time that the people that also make this possible is the participants. So thank you for participating in the summer of next 2022 as well. And I've heard and seen that you guys are doing some pretty great work. So thanks to this, uh, to, to the Anal, to the Analnet Foundation, to the European Commission, the Nexus Foundation and Tweak for their support. And yeah, without holding you guys up any longer, I will pull uh, Tom in here, who's going to talk about uh, Hydra. So yeah, welcome, Tom. Hello, everyone. Um, I guess uh, so. My name's uh, Tom Berechny. Um I've been in the Nix community for I think approaching a decade now, and uh, I'm a big fan of essentially how this technology uh, is used how it came to, and uh, an aspect of this is something called Hydra. So today uh, we are going to be bringing up uh, basically an introduction to Hydra. The purpose of this is to make it uh, less scary, to kind of show that this is something that uh, you can do yourself and leverage yourself and perhaps kind of expose some uh, you know tips and tricks along the way. And then at the end, we'll do some uh, questions and answers. So let's get started. Uh, hopefully everyone can see this. All right, so uh, again, this is going to be a little bit about you know what Hydra is, uh, why it exists, um, a little bit about how to get started, uh, and then we'll talk about um, how to use it. Um, this kind of uh, it was going to be a little bit of opinionated, but this is just an example of how uh, you can use it for your own projects and for your own organizations. Um, then we'll go a little bit into like what it takes to uh, either host your own Hydra. Um, sometimes there's some quirks related to that if uh, that's something that you wish to do. Uh, we'll talk a little about how you want to like edit or you know change Hydra, how to work with it in terms of um, contributing to it or modifying it. And then at the end, we'll go hands-on and we'll actually run through some examples. And uh, feel free to add in any questions as we go. Um, if there's notice something, uh, I might just kind of answer in line. Um, or we could kind of leave some things toward the end, depending on how people would like to do that. All right, so what is Hydra? Uh, Hydra is a uh, you know continuous build system that is uh, designed to work uh, natively with the way Nix operates. Um, so it's built on top of the uh, Nix build system, the Nix package manager, and it does this uh, continuous build process. The jobs that it's going to perform are all declared using Nix. And so it is a very much like a, you know, uh, you eat your own dog food sort of a situation and trying to make it so that uh, it is a very cohesive thing. Uh, the idea here is this also kind of supports like the uh, you know, automatic builds, automatic updates um, as things get pushed along in terms of source code or in terms of repositories. Um, all of this is uh, managed for you in you know somewhat of a nice way and provides a user interface and it provides a uh, you know larger build system for you to like run through. Uh, this uh, original paper um, kind of was uh, is interesting to read through. This is kind of where Hydra came from, so I'll, I'll include a um, uh, these slides in a link uh, at the conclusion. Uh, but you kind of go through an initial uh, discussion of where the Hydra goes. It comes from uh, some of Ilko's work uh, you know, way back when. Um, and uh, currently there's a, a Hydra instance that kind of manages and does the like largest, I guess, deployment of this is to do the builds for Nix packages. One of the main purposes of uh, the Hydra that we have deployed at the moment is to uh, build everything in Nix packages and to populate a cache. The big benefit of this is that now uh, Nix users don't have to build everything from source themselves or to have their own cache, but now they have the benefit of uh, binary caching for essentially almost everything that exists in Nix packages. There's exceptions with regards to things that either don't build or things that are unfree, and there's you know, various policy reasons for those. Uh, but for the most part, uh, this is what powers and is a huge benefit for the uh, Nix community. And so uh, 
keeping that system uh, healthy and alive is uh, one of the responsibilities of the community. Uh, I kind of grabbed this from uh, a slide from Sander Vanderberg, um, basically describing a little bit more about you know what Hydra itself is. So uh, this is a build system, um, but it's also generic. So it's kind of, in that case, a meta build system. Uh, and in that sense, it can do builds for various different languages. This is in inherited because of how it uses Nix uh, as its builder. Uh, this can also support deployment. So we can also use um, Hydra to uh, either like push things to other places, or it can also be serve as a thing to pull things from. So you get an idea of things like the latest build. You have concepts like running hooks at the end of a, of a build. You can populate a cache, um, push things into a cache at the conclusion of builds. All these concepts help um, you know, utilize Hydra uh, as a deployment uh, tool. Uh, you can kind of have uh, many different kinds of builds that all coexist, right? This isolation that we get again from the uh, you know underlying uh, Nix basis of it gives us isolation. Um, we can kind of support multiple architectures. You can support you know variations of builds, and all these coexist. They don't interfere with with each other. Um, this means you don't have to have a uh, essentially a fresh VM or a fresh container building everything, and you get a lot of reuse. This is one of the benefits of using Hydra is that the, the reuse between builds is um, very high because you're, you're using you know, essentially the same machines, you're reusing store pads, you're reusing dependencies um, in, a, in a, a pretty beneficial way. Um, so next we have, a, you know, I mentioned a little bit about multi-platform support. So if you have um, different kinds of builders, different machines, you can kind of hook all these up so that if there's some sort of a, a of a build or there's some sort of a package that requires either unique hardware or it just needs to be you know built on a particular kind of machine then um, that is all supported and these builds get distributed and pushed out to the correct builders all the logs and all the build artifacts uh, are also then you know brought back into a central location and are then available uh, this uh, it could be used in all sorts of very interesting ways um, but generally speaking that's uh, you know a helpful thing uh, scalability. So this is the next piece, which is, you know, when you get to something to the size of Nix packages, uh, you're going to need to want to have lots of machines. Um, you can't just have like one beefy machine do everything. Um, and so to spread the load out and to start doing a little bit of dynamic scaling, um, Hydra gives the capability to do that. So once your, uh, the builds you're doing are expand beyond the, the scope of a you know, single machine, uh, we try to do a uh, little bit more capability here. All right, uh, let's go a little bit into the Hydra components. Um, so Hydra is based on Nix. So you know, one of the main things it needs to kind of have up and running on the system is to have a, a store, have Nix installed, have a, a functioning version of Nix. Uh, this is how it kind of does all the builds, um, the sandboxing those builds, the uh, you know, orchestration of them, a lot of how the, it, the, the builds are distributed. Um, kind of what sorts of machines are available. All this is kind of core Nix functionality that's being used for the purpose of uh, performing you know, these larger skill uh, continuous uh, builds. Uh, next, uh, we have a Postgres database. Uh, this is used to um, provide um, tracking and information above and beyond what just Nix itself is going to manage. So this provides a little more historicity. Um, you kind of keep track of builds over time. Uh, you can start, start to organize yourself a bit more than just Nix itself is going to give you organization. So if you want to organize things into projects and job sets, um, you're going to have like concepts like users. You can kind of keep track of metrics over time. Um, all of this information is what goes in the database and depends on Postgres. Uh, that database could be kind of hosted on the same machine that's hosting your Hydra. It can also be a remote um, you know, instance in case you wanna have you know, some sort of failover or you know, distinguishing between um, whatever like your Hydra uh, server is and where that um, database is hosted. But yeah, it's just a Postgres instance. Uh, next we have the evaluator. Um, this component is what takes um, your, you know, your expressions that define your jobs and evaluates them and tries to basically find jobs to do. Um, the point of this is to kind of collect everything and to uh, then set this up and organize them. For example, some of these jobs might require certain kinds of hardware or certain system features or require 
you know, certain sorts of architectures. So that's how uh, Hydra will know how to distribute these jobs and where they should go. Um, you know, the scheduler now tries to also make sure that you do things in order, right? If you have a job that's going to be required for other jobs, then obviously you want to do things in, in, in the correct order and distribute that accordingly. Uh, queue runner, this is the piece that's going to uh, take all those jobs that are, you know, in the queue and start going through them and, and try to try to make sure that those jobs are, uh, again, distributed. And then once they're done, everything is kind of pulled back, all the logic that you might need to run, like let's say you might need to run hooks or you need to run jobs at the conclusion um, of those. Uh, these are kind of the responsibilities of, of the, uh, the queue runner. There's a server involved. Uh, this is to you know, give you, you know, your, your API, it's to give you a web page and an interface. Um, and these are you know, somewhat independent um, and they, you know, they interact um, you know, to get basically the job done of giving us a uh, you know, fully functioning Hydra instance. Implementation wise, uh, there's a whole bunch of uh, you know, Perl running under the hood. This is just based on the historic nature of where this came from and made it uh, you know, possible to get this up and running. Um, so if anyone uh, has a lot of uh, Perl experience and knowledge and wants to contribute, uh, contributions are always welcome. All right, why do we have Hydra? Um, you know, question would be, hey, why not just use some other CI uh, paradigm? Well, uh, what happens is, you know, a lot of most other CI paradigms are these days kind of based on some sort of containerization. So there's a there's a large degree of isolation that you get between those, and that's not necessarily the friendliest in terms of how Nix operates. Nix can kind of work in other container systems, but it doesn't leverage Nix to its full benefits. So a good example of this is if you have um, a bunch of jobs that are let's say slight variations of each other, and they reuse a lot of dependencies, right? Those already exist in the file system when you're talking about a Hydra builder. Um, this is very efficient. Um, it's everything's kind of all present already. Whereas if you're doing every single build in some sort of a fresh container, you have to kind of do a lot of work to kind of rebind mount everything in the right way, redoing a lot of the sort of work that, um, you know, Nix already can do, and it can do it in a very efficient manner. It can fetch things and reuse a lot of those dependencies that sometimes, you know, other CI systems or like Docker-based systems are going to have a hard time doing. Um, other things is now, you know, this is, I can declare my jobs in the same way, declare my builds. I can declare my, you know, runtime hooks in the same way. So there's a very a cohesiveness of the ecosystem that you also get when you're using Hydra. Um, you don't have to use, you know, one sort of YAML language to declare your job and then go into declaring how your package is built in Nix and then, you know, declaring, you know, how, you know, webhooks are run and get another kind of de declarative language or some other system. So having a cohesiveness here is extremely helpful. Um, so next, uh, you know, we have, you know, your jobs are declared the same way. Um, having th this be automatically updated. So... Uh, if you have, let's say, PRs to some sort of a uh, package set, or you have changes that have rolled down the pipeline and you don't want to go around to test things yourself, having that be automatic, automatically tested, having you know, you know, tests run for you uh, by this sort of continuous uh, integration system is also extremely helpful. Um, so that's uh, useful. And then lastly, if you want to distribute your builds, right? Um, if you Yep. For smaller projects, you might just be able to build something yourself. But once you start, you know, growing outside the scale of something you want to kind of run on uh, a single machine, or you want to, you don't want to deal with distributing it yourself, and you want this to be kind of a little bit more uh, scalable, um, have a little bit more, um, you know, fault tolerance, then running Hydra kind of gives you this capability to say, "Hey, uh, I have a lot of work to do. I just want to run continuously, and I don't want to have to worry about it." Um, that's a little bit better than having to kind of go around and do a lot of like Nix invocations yourself and do a lot of bookkeeping, right? Hydra does a lot of this bookkeeping for us. All right. Uh, so how actually are we going to start using Hydra? Um, so there's, uh, you know, two instances I'd say that, you know, people should be familiar with, um, if, especially if they're part of Summer of Nix. You've got your um, main instance. This lives at uh, Hydra Nix.org. Let's Go check this out. This is, uh, we'll say, the the main Hydra run by uh, you know, the the Nix community and the uh, Nix OS Foundation. 
and it serves as like the kind of the the main hydra that is going to build and run um, all of the Nix packages. There's you know several projects that we're supporting and uh, you know serve as the builders for. But the biggest one to be familiar with is you know Nix packages and building of that. Um, there's a large set of infrastructure around it. There's a lot of machines that are uh, available. You can kind of go see, hey, there's a whole bunch of them. They're doing various sorts of builds at the moment. So that's various, uh, that's, that's, that's relatively helpful. Uh, there is also a Hydra uh, that was used for Summer of Nix that's available for the participant at, at uh, NGI. So let's go take a look at that. Here's another one. It's another deployment, it's an independent deployment from the, from the other one for a little bit of uh, you know, fault tolerance and also to try out different features. Uh, this got some use last year, um, trying to see if we wanna get more use of this this year. So if uh, you're a participant, you wanna be able to start putting your projects in here, uh, you, you know, contact me, let me know if you'd like to get an account and we can get that uh, figured out and added and you can start kind of using this for, for builds. This is not as, um, I'll say, uh, uh, well supported in terms of how much uh, infrastructure and how, mu how much uh, compute is put behind it, but it should be enough for you know what we are doing um, if we're not trying to do like full builds of like you know like next packages. Um, so that's how you can get started. Uh, you can get yourself an account there. There's various ways to um, have uh, you know those logins created, um, but that's how you know, we can get started. Uh, contact administrator, yeah, so once you get a user account, you can get additional you know, permissions either to create projects or to kind of manage them in various ways. Um, sometimes it's helpful to have uh, permissions in the, the big Hydra to like restart jobs or to help uh, kind of cancel things that you know are going to fail so it doesn't like take up compute. Um, some of that management goes into um, how the uh, you know, Nix packages releases take place as well. So uh, maybe we can kind of get started here. So um, the basic first basic things you're gonna to want to do is like, hey, I have a I have a project. I want to create a job set. I want to get some builds right. So let's see what that looks like. Um, let's see where we've got this saved. All right. So if you go to uh, your Hydra, let's make things a little bit bigger so people can see better. And uh, so there's the admin section on top. Um, and if, you, if you're able to do so, you'll be able to create a project. Um, when you create a project, you'll end up with an interface that, like this. Various options, some are self-explanatory, so you, know, you can enable them, make them visible and visible, kind of get some information about like, what to call it, where to put it. Um, you can start putting in information like uh, you know, who the owner is. Uh, there's some capabilities here to kind of email people if uh, a build or a project that they're responsible for breaks. Um, you know, sometimes that's useful, sometimes not. So turning that on and on, on and off is a, a choice that you have. Um, lastly, down here, there's a section here called a declarative spec file. Uh, for now, we're going to leave this blank, but we'll come back to this to kind of describe what this is. But basically, if you want to not go through the work of just defining your own job sets, or if you want your job sets to be dynamically um, declared. So a really good example of this is that you might want a job set created for every single pull request to a project you may have. If so, right, there's a mechanism to make that possible um, and you can do that by um, having declarative job sets. Um, we call that a dynamic uh, you know, job sets. We'll skip that for now and leave that blank and we will create a project. Um, and then you end up with this. So cool, project was created, but because we didn't declare anything, that's fine, um, nothing exists. Uh, first job thing you're going to want to do is to create a brand new job set. So we'll go actions, create a job set. And now you've got a bunch of options here. Um, things like, hey, I want to like just kind of work on something for a short time or want to do like only like one job at a time. Um, there are different possibilities here. Um, we could uh, start building something out uh, in terms of an identifier. The type here talks about how you're going to, to uh, declare your projects. Uh, there's uh, Flake and Legacy. Um, for most of Summer and Next, we've kind of adopted the experimental features of Flakes. And so for now, I'll demonstrate this. There's equivalence in terms of Legacy. Uh, and in fact, uh, Hydra support for Legacy is actually a little bit better. It's kind of a little bit more tightly integrated. Uh, there's capabilities kind of in the pipeline to make the Flake integration better. Um, 
but it also is more convenient to get started. So um, from getting started perspective these days, I do recommend that, hey, if you already have a flake defined, might as well continue to use that paradigm um, with your definition of new job sets. All right, so we give this a, a quick uh, description and let's give it a URI. So what we'll do is we'll say, um, we'll give it my Hydra demo URI. Let's also take a look at what this project is. So I've got a repo here, it just says Hydra demo. Um, ignore these two for now, these are related to the declarative jobs, but this is just a simple flake. I think I have a few simple uh, jobs here defines, a few examples, some like random things to kind of give this something to work for, work on. So uh, you define this using your flake URIs. That should be relatively simple. Uh, check interval. Um, this is asking, hey, how long or how often should Hydra check for uh, updates? Um, by default, Hydra is just going to check, you know, every, you know, usually you, know, well, you give it like a few minutes or something like that, uh, say 200 seconds. Um, but you could turn this around and make it uh, so that it receives a webhook. If you would like to kind of have that a little bit, be a little bit more live and not polling, again, that takes a little bit more setup, a little bit more configuration to set that up. Uh, scheduling shares, uh, this is like how much of the machine it should have access to in terms of um, when there's contention for resources. Um, so you can kind of put some number in there. You can see right now, uh, okay, there's 5,000 or so shares in use. So let's only grab like 100 of those. Whether or not we want emails, looks like we're not going to turn that on for the moment. And then how many evaluations to keep? This is like how much history to keep um, around and, you know, uh, when we should start doing, you know, more garbage collection of that work. Um, obviously doing this for, you know, too long, is going to kind of start to impact, you know, just space and database usage. Uh, you know, for something simple like this, we'll just do like three or so. All right, so uh, we created this job set and now this is gonna go download that project. And when it comes to flakes, the way this will work is they'll try to find anything that is defined as a Hydra job. We have a few Hydra jobs defined here um, and we'll see if that works out. Um, okay, so looks like that evaluation succeeded. We'll go over to the jobs column and see what they are. looks like there's three of them already in there. Cool, we have a tester, Read me tester and tester two, and this is a pretty good reflection of what we have here. Tester, 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 read me. Um, so let's kind of now use this to dig into kind of the structure of Hydra itself. Um, so when we have uh, at the top level, you have things called projects. This is kind of do the top level organization. You saw us create one to begin with. Once you dig into a particular uh, project, now you have job sets. We call ours test. Um, sometimes people will have uh, different job sets for different branches or for different purposes, different outcomes they're looking for. Um, and then inside of each job set, you will have a set of jobs. And these jobs can be um, you know, all the different variations that are supported. Um, and this gives you a little bit of logical grouping that lets kind of you, you know, ease your life a little bit. Uh, and then, so let's go into one of these jobs. So what happened? Uh, here's a job. We can kind of get a little bit of information about it. There's, you know, charts and links that start to be created. Um, there's only one job for this at the moment, so it's not super helpful, uh, but we can kind of dig into what a job is. Uh, job is a derivation. The, uh, the Nix uh, subsystem underneath it's going to build the thing. And then, you know, the results of that are displayed here. Uh, we can dig into a little bit of detail for this one. I just kind of grabbed a um, package that I kind of already exists, so that wasn't really much of a uh, question whether or not it would succeed. But you can kind of get a little bit of detail for it. Um, here on the inputs column, for example, this is kind of a case where, yes, there are inputs, but there this page is geared towards the legacy version of declaring uh, jobs, not the flake method. So um, this is something that kind of needs a little bit of uh, improvement. Uh, I like the build dependencies kind of graph showing all the bookkeeping taking place of like, hey, here's like my derivation and here's all the different things that it took to build it all the way down and tracking and seeing the whole like build time, uh, you know, graph of this is very interesting, at least in some sense. And you can kind of dig into, uh, you know, the logs of each of those. Um, you also see like logs of, 
some of these. Uh, oh, this is already substituted, so we didn't have to do a build. But if the system did have to do a build, you can go grab the logs there. Uh, so this is kind of a good kind of high level of um, you know how the you know basic usage of this works. Um, the nice part is now when your your job set is defined. Let's go take a look at how this was built. This URI is simply the pointer for it. So uh, every 200 seconds, Hydra will go to this uh, URI, fetch it down again, see if there's any changes. And if there are, they'll go through this whole process all over again and build anything that's been changed. So this is kind of like that automatic building process of it um, that kind of gives you a little freedom for having to like just go and build everything, every commit yourself. Um, and now we're we're set up. So this is kind of the most basic usage you could you could kind of possibly imagine. Is now I have a simple project or a job that's run. Right, so that's uh, that's not bad. It gives us uh, uh, something to work with. Uh, so hopefully that demo so far was successful. All right. Um, now let's go into a little bit more kind of. Uh, a little more advanced features. So let's say you want to start hosting Hydra yourself. You want to start configuring it, right? There's all sorts of configuration options here. Um, the simplest method is just to use uh, uh, NixOS itself because we have a service module defined for it. And so you can use that. Going into a service module, you can see there's all, tons of definitions in here. Uh, we can go to the NixOS module options and see all the different ways you could kind of manage and configure your Hydra. Uh, highly recommend reading through and understanding these things um, and trying to get an idea of like what's what's possible. Uh, something to mention though is that the uh, you know there is some you know documentation about the configuration of Hydra itself and you can kind of go through the documentation that's in you know it's in GitHub. I think it's also hosted on the Nixus org webpage. Um, there's also, uh, there are options that are like not necessarily easy to see or find here. So just the fact of the matter is, is the sometimes the easiest way to understand what's possible is to go look at other um, other people's configurations or, you know, reading through the source sometimes is another way to discover uh, new options that, you know, you weren't familiar with. Um, so that's kind of a work in progress. Um, we need more help with uh, making sure all that is well documented and well explained. So uh, yeah, configuration can be a little bit annoying, but starting with the NixOS module options is usually good enough to get you started. Um, all right, um, some of the issues you might run into for trying to host your own Hydra, um, making sure that the Hydra you're using is you know compatible with the version of Nix you're using. So there's kind of Hydra, Nix, and you know Nix daemon relationships that need to be you know kept track of. Uh, these can be managed with a NixOS module option called uh, Services Hydra Package. Um, some other useful things to mention. So there's uh, build machines files. So if you would like to declare builders that are going to be dynamically updated, or if you'd like to kind of just specify a lot of builders, um, then a build machine file is kind of the way to do that. Uh, this allows you to point um, Hydra at the fact that there's, you'll say, I don't know, 15 different builders available with different capabilities. And here's how you can like SSH those things or here's how you can access them and distribute jobs. Uh, there's a system of uh, like required system features. This is kind of a bit more advanced if we wanna like push particular jobs to particular kinds of machines. Um, I've used this in the past to push uh, jobs that require either like GPU or they require like connected hardware or you know some other like you know nuanced things um, allows you to kind of have a little bit more fine grade control over where and how jobs are pushed. Um, we use this for example to if uh, there are certain jobs that require virtualization, um, that's kind of used to help make sure that those jobs go to those machines that have those capabilities um, versus you know let's say a, a machine that cannot do that sort of a build. Uh, configuration. Let's go into a little bit about like what the configs. Uh, I mentioned about how so there's some difficulty in having a full understanding of all the options that are available. Again, we need help with that. Uh, mentioned the uh, build machine files. This is kind of a great way to do auto scaling. So um, you can make it so that you have these, uh, you know, your machines may, might be either dynamically uh, generated as some sort of like auto scaling uh, effort if you're working in the cloud or if you want them to be dynamically joined. Uh, into the builder system. That's all possible set up to set up. Um, it's 
there isn't quite a, an established way to do like an agent based joining. Um, I, although that is possible to set up, um, a lot of that is kind of you have to build that capability yourself. Um, the standard approach that these build machines uh, tend to work is that hybrid kind of reaches out to them rather the other way around. Um, again, you can work your way around that with like some networking uh, and some configuration that, that you have to kind of set that up yourself. Uh, then there's the capability to do run command hooks. This is another interesting thing where usually if you're going to do some sort of a build um, as part of like a, a project testing or some sort of like CI CD, at the end of the conclusion, you're going to want to do something that, you know, is not really part of a build, but more like a notification. You're going to want to tell some other system, hey, I'm done, or hey, this was successful, or hey, this failed. Um, this is the sort of thing that you would kind of put into a uh, run command at the conclusion or would be performed after a build is done. This is all just kind of give a whirlwind introduction to these things are, are possible to do. Uh, let's say you want to hack on Hydra itself. Um, so the there are actually, the, the docs for this are, are pretty good. They get you up and running. Um, so I'll go, let's go take a look at that. Um, there's uh, some pretty good hacking.md docs that get you, you know, started in terms of having a functional and running instance that is uh, local. And there's a Foreman-based, um, um, you know, proc file system that lets you kind of get up and running in terms of all the databases you need, the servers you need, and orchestrates all those for you, uh, which is pretty convenient. So if you'd like to kind of host it yourself and run it, you can do so. Um, let's go see if I've got my, uh, yeah. So I have a version of Hydra running here, just runs on localhost, and you can kind of test it out and play with it in a relatively cheap and easy manner. Um, so you can kind of see I've got various jobs um, loaded there. So I highly recommend uh, trying that approach. Um, so now let's kind of, I'll go through a few more uh, kind of things to demonstrate. And then after that, we'll go into questions. So yes, uh, absolutely. Uh, if uh, you're part of the Summer of Next, it's, we can get ourselves uh, accounts and start using the NGI ho uh, hosted Hydra. Um, and here I've got a few little demos I started playing with. So we saw the Hydra demo basic. There's the one we just made manually. Uh, let's go look at uh, just Hydra demo. Um, this one's interesting because right now um, we made it, we didn't have to make these uh, job sets ourselves. Uh, instead, we just declared them. So this is the, an example of the declarative job set. Um, so we can take a look at how uh, that is created. So if we look at our repository, I have a uh, spec.json. Okay, and using a you know relatively simple JSON structure, you could define, hey, I want to have a, a job that's called branch two, and I want a job for like my master branch. Okay, and then simply by doing that and pointing Hydra at this, now your jobs or job sets are created for you rather than having to go do that work yourself or kind of redo it, let's say, if you're moving things around. That's a relatively nice way to kind of uh, manage and orchestrate this. Uh, that job set kind of creation is kind of also a, a job uh, of its own. And that gets kind of reevaluated and um, you know managed for you, and so that these are then created. There's a next level of declarativeness you can get that starts to make it more dynamic. So an example of this uh, you can see in my local Hydra. Let's go grab a look at that. So here I've got job sets that are now in a declarative way. So this just starts to show a little bit more of the integration that's possible. Uh, for example, it can detect that, hey, uh, in GitHub, I have a PR, and that PR is something that wants to be given its own job set, and then any sort of jobs that are declared inside of that become right part of that. So you can see, hey, I have a test of branch two uh, job set created, and if we go back to our um, Git repo, you can see, hey, we have a test branch two uh, PR. It looks like that was created last year. So, and Excellent, that got detected and that got turned into its own job set. So that's uh, starts to show some of the capabilities that, of you know, integration that we'd like to see. Uh, managing that uh, is, is done by this, uh, if your spec JSON has a slightly different structure, you could uh, point it at um, an input to say, hey, I want to have a high, uh, a 
um, you basically declare, I'm gonna have an input of where the uh, definition is going to be stored. So in this case, it's in its own repo. And then say, hey, we need to evaluate something called a, you know, a job sets.nix. That's gonna then point at a, another file called a job sets.nix. Here you can kind of go as far into the complexity that, you, that you'd like. Again, the best way to learn about this at the moment really is to kind of look at other people's examples. Feel free to look at you know this one. I copied a cool bunch of this from other people that I found. And you can kind of take a look at what it does. Roughly it's, hey, uh, take a look at the pull requests that the, um, uh, the, Perl, the, the GitHub pulls plugin provides, um, iterate through them and create um, new job sets for those. Also, if I have particular job sets that are gonna be used for, um, let's say exact branches that I care about, I can kind of declare those in here. Um, and then you create again, a JSON that looks much like what we saw earlier and that, that will populate and create your declarative job sets. Um, and then you end up with something like, uh, let's go grab a good example, something like this. So we have two branches that were created on my behalf, gen generative and master, and then looks like a, you know the PR one got automatically generated dynamically. So this is a good way to test this out. Um, you have to be a little bit careful, right? If you want to expose this for like a, a public or open source projects, because then you know any PR to your um, project then automatically gets a job created. And then now there's a little bit of issue of whether or not you want to allow that. So um, just be, be consider the fact that by someone creating a PR, they're then kind of going to be running perhaps builds um, on your um, on your machine. Um, so that's uh, kind of rolls out um, some of the examples of GitHub polls, some of the declarative projects, and the, some of the capabilities that we have. Um, I want to leave some time here for um, questions or kind of if there's anything in particular people are interested in to dig more detail into. Yes, thank you, Tom. That was very interesting and very insightful. Um, I'm going to also pull in one of my colleagues, uh, Matthias. You guys have seen him before. So hello, Matthias. Um, and there definitely are some questions coming in. Um, before I let Matthias uh, go have his round, um, Bilen Wanek, uh, again, I'm sorry, I'm horrible with these names, um, but they ask spec.json, why not spec.nix? Uh, so the um, the simplest uh, way to declare a project is just to have it be static. And so the, the spec.json is the um, most basically static way of doing so. Um, the next example I showed where it was like the dynamic projects, that's where the spec.json just points to a Nix file where you have the full power and dynamic nature of Nix to generate a more complicated um a more complicated uh, set of job sets. Yeah, makes sense. Um, I think I'll let Matthias go because he has some pretty interesting questions. Yes, uh, thanks, Brian. And thanks, Tom. This, this was a great, super detailed uh, overview. And you took away uh, <laughs> already uh, a few of my questions uh, later on in uh, the presentation, but I have um, still a few left. So one of them is yeah, you mentioned or you presented in the beginning the different components of Hydra. Uh, do you think a few of them could be actually handed over to or the responsibilities of a few of these components could be handed over to other tools or libraries in the future? Do you think Hydra could be made a bit more lightweight in terms of the implementation? Yes, um, I think part of the reason we'd like that is kind of better integration with other CI. Um, so right now, uh, if you know, you, you don't necessarily want to kind of force people to have to, to to choose between kind of either existing CI that they might already be used elsewhere in an organization or a project, um, and so maybe. You know, some some things that would be interesting would be if you have um, you know Hydra running for organizational purposes, just to keep track and do the bookkeeping and for like presentation, uh, but you still want to do your um, actual builds elsewhere in CI. Um, what something that might be interesting is to have this sort of like a runner that can 
uh, you know, grab this work and then push um, data into Hydra rather than it be kind of just sitting there waiting for work. So it's kind of a slightly different paradigm of how uh, jobs could be run. You know, those are some some possibilities. Um, Hydra does have the capability to do more interesting scheduling. Um, so the the scheduling capabilities there can definitely be improved. So there's 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 room for work there. Um, I'm, there's a lot of stuff that can be done. Um, I think the the expert on that one uh, to probably talk to is Graham Christensen. Um, so you know, definitely see kind of the sorts of things he wants to uh, work on or look at. Um, see what the possibilities there are. Uh, Hydra does need kind of additional support, so we do need more people working on it. Um, and you know, some of these integrations and some of the niceties we, you know we want to do are going to probably require that we. Um, either do like either major overhauls or rewrites. Um, but again, that's part of a, a, a larger effort um, to figure out what exactly those things need to be. So I wonder as a follow up to this, uh, Tom, I had, I'm, I'm wondering if you have a, a question or if you want to get involved with Hydra, should people just write to Graham or is there, what is the best place to reach out and to, to get started with, with that? <sighs> Uh, I'd say it depends on what people's preference are for for getting um, for getting into collaborations. So uh, there is a uh, Matrix channel uh, dedicated for for Hydra. There's also um, you can contact people over uh, Discourse, um, or even just going to like if you just want to work on just PRs and issues and get jump in the code base. You can also go to the GitHub and go kind of read through uh, what are the uh, issues there. So. It's at uh, nixos slash Hydra, and there are plenty of issues, plenty of pull requests, plenty of things to work on. Um, but I'd say, yeah, those are, those are the main ways to contact people. If someone has any questions, also feel free to go and contact me. Um, I'm usually in Matrix and or Discourse. OK, great. And then I have a question, maybe you're not the right one to answer it, but I wonder if there's anyone already thinking about offering such Hydra style CI as a service or a managed solution so that people don't have to do to deploy everything themselves, even though it's quite easy to do, but. Yeah, um, so there are a few kind of similar features out there. Um, so in, in, the, in this realm, I'd say the ones to, to take a look at are uh, things like uh, Nix Build Net, Hercules CI, and Cloud Hydra. These are kind of the, uh, variations of hey let's provide you know easier large scale nix building um you know services uh those are probably kind of the best ones to look at um, if there's any other ones i've missed please let me know okay yeah thanks that's that's all the questions that i had so handing back to brian yes thank you over on Oncast, um, Akenji asks, in what way would the input tab be changed for the new Nix command? Would it surface the same information or different information? Uh, yeah, so this is one of the uh, interesting issues with um, as we go into support for Flakes, um, uh, the inputs right are now kind of much more clearly tracked. Uh, this is both a good thing and a bad thing, right? Um, so one thing it would expose is something very similar to what you would see when you look at the, uh, let's say, a Flake metadata, all that lock file information. Uh, a feature that's kind of has been kind of asked about or talked about, there are some patches out there that kind of start to implement this, uh, would be to uh, opportunistically, let's say, uh, upgrade those uh, lock files and try to do evaluation and jobs, you know, before those locks are actually committed to a repo. Um, that's kind of one aspect of it. Or if they're, you have, let's say you have a repository that doesn't have any locks, you purposefully don't put a lock in there because what you want perhaps is for Hydra to generate that at the moment to grab the master branch or you know, master commit from everything, you know, get the head commits and then pull those down and then do a fresh evaluation. Uh, this is more opportunistic evaluation and job building. Um, some of those uh, you can kind of hack your way around them. Some of those kind of just need uh, changes to Hydra itself. Um, but a lot of that, I believe, is just waiting for um, that whole feature set to go out of experimental um, and to be stable, and then Hydra kind of can kind of follow along and make that user experience much nicer. So it's not as nice as, as you could imagine it being. Um, there's room for improvement. Okay, nice. Um, then on 
Matrix Ruro Ruro sorry asks you mentioned that you can do deployments with Hydra. Could you elaborate? Uh, so you know depends on you know, if you want to do pull or or, or push based. Um, so uh, one you could just pull. Um, so all these jobs. Uh, let's go grab a random job. Hopefully this all works out nicely. So there's links to uh, that Hydra hosts that are going to be always like the latest finished evaluation. If you have a particular job, there's going to be links also to the latest successful build. So by querying this, you can always get like, hey, give me the latest that's that's built. Give me the latest that has artifacts. Uh, that could be useful for, for a pull-based system. Uh, for something like push-based, you would want to do something like having run commands defined. Um, so after a job is run, uh, Let's see if I can kind of find a good example of this. Um, so you can, you can define a run command hook. And, and a run command hook, uh, right now, look, I think I have, it, does, it just outputs some JSON. But a run command hook will kind of run at the conclusion of a build. And here's where you can start to do impure things. Like you can go tell another system, hey, I finished my job. Uh, now, like, perform a deployment or something like that. Um, so there's a that, that's where you start to have the push-based deployment capabilities uh, defined. Uh, another important feature that you can do with Hydra is to say, uh, at the conclusion of, of the build, uh, push all those results into some sort of a binary cache, and that binary cache can serve as um, you know supporting uh, uh, whatever deployment mechanism you have. So there isn't a lot of opinionated deployment uh, aspects. You can, can build several different ways of doing it yourself. Um, I think that would be one uh, kind of improvement um, that is possible is to have more uh, opinionated and like built-in ready, readily available deployment mechanisms uh, supported by Hydra. Okay, cool. Um, I'm gonna take one from YouTube. Um, Lee Yuch asks, any plans to rewrite it in something other than Perl? Uh, I mean, I, that, that has come up before. Um, is any any plans for that? I, I I'm not aware of any. Um, you know, I, I know that there you know the attempts for this sort of thing. You know, an example of this would be something like Hercules CI, right? Would be, um, I believe, if I recall, that's uh, that's in Haskell. Um, so it's not necessarily a Hydra rewrite. It's kind of a reimagining of how to do it. Um, but directly taking Hydra itself and doing a rewrite, I'm not familiar or aware of any efforts. Um, there, ha there are a lot of efforts right now to improve the quality of the, the Perl code. So that's a lot of what uh, Graham's been working on. Um, but I'm not aware of a full, like, let's take Hydra as is and rewrite it. Okay. Um, there was a follow-up question on Matrix on the, the original question was uh, spec.json, why not spec.nix? Um, Nops continued on that question and asked, still why JSON and not YAML or TOML, which I consider much easier to read and write by hand? Um, uh, legacy. I mean, it's just, I don't believe that, uh, you know, at, at that time when, uh, you know, Hydra was originally kind of worked on, these features were added. Uh, if, you know, YAML and TOML were kind of in, in use at that stage. So uh, I just think this is just a, a question of uh, history, not a question of like explicit design or excluding it for a particular reason. Makes sense. And then there's one more question that I can see over in Matrix, and that is, is there a way to run Hydra jobs in Kubernetes? So this has to do with this aspect of um, you know having dynamic builders. Uh, possible, yes, um, but you have to kind of hook that all up yourself and kind of make it all work and get that machinery going. There's no kind of there's no button that says hey enable Kubernetes and then, now you get a, you know you get everything for free. Uh, so possible, yes, because there's a lot of like a lot of the control you need to do so is exposed to you, but like making it all work and hooking it all up. Uh, it, it is that that part right now is your responsibility at the moment that does take a little bit, bit of experience and expertise. Um, but possible, yeah. Um, you know, one uh, you know initial way to, to do this would be, hey, if you have a builder, you know, Kubernetes defines some builders. Those builders, as they get stood up, they register themselves. Basically, we add them to that build machines file that we talked about. That is going to be dynamically read and looked at by Hydra to add and remove uh, potential builders from its set of machines it can contact. And then at that point, if Hydra can 
basically go distribute those jobs to those Kubernetes machines, it will. Um, so the, that's usually going to be the primary mechanism for like auto scaling uh, builders up and down is that build machines file. So it's even a bit more um, abstracted than Kubernetes. It doesn't even matter where the machines are hosted, if I understand correctly. Yeah, um, I had an example once where I had uh, like Raspberry Pis uh, volunteering themselves as builders. Um, we had, uh, you can have like, you know, if you want MacBooks, if you want stuff from cloud, if you want stuff from Kubernetes, like it's in that sense, it's uh, kind of the world is your oyster. You can decide to do lots of different things. Um, but you just have to kind of go figure out how to get that done. Um, and that's kind of where the some of the usability questions lie is like, while all those things are possible, it does mean you have to kind of go do the work yourself. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, I have one more question myself, which is perhaps a little bit of an annoying one. Um, but the question was, uh, Nix recently gained support to like write extensions, like plugins, so to speak. Do you think that like the functionality of Hydra could be implemented as an extension of Nix. That makes sense, the question. Interesting. Um, so not necessarily as a Nix maybe plugin, mm -hmm. um, because it's like, so the, 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 the Nix plugin system is kind of more designed for like, let's add built-ins or, um, you know, let's add you know, add, add sub commands, things along those lines. Uh, I would say for Hydra is kind of a, uh, it's like an inversion of control based on kind of how usually, you know, Nix uh, is going to run and schedule its builds. Mm -hmm. So maybe not necessarily as a Nix plugin. Um, there is Nix functionality perhaps that can be kind of more tightly integrated with Hydra. Yes. Um, I think that's possible. So let's say you can add some sub commands that kind of interact with it and, and relate to it. Yeah. Um, but yeah. Um, now, Hydra itself is using uh, like Nix libraries um, mm -hmm. for its for its work, and you know, especially the you know the evaluator. Um, these things are kind of going to be using um, Nix itself. Whether or not we can abstract away something so they can run both kind of Nix and Hydra style scheduling uh, is probably, I'd say, maybe. I mean, it's, it's an interesting idea, um, but I think we have. Uh, we have a uh, closer alligators to the boat than th than that one. <laughs> oh yeah, no, definitely. Yeah, <laughs> it was more of a. Uh, uh, that's why I said an annoying question. <laughs> no, it's interesting. I, I think uh, uh, John Erickson mentioned something along these lines uh, a few months ago. Um, I don't recall exactly, so maybe ping him and see if see what his thoughts are. Usually, his thoughts are very insightful. Okay, I will. Um. I am looking, I do not see any more questions coming in. So if I do not see any coming in within like 10, 15 seconds, uh, I think we'll call it a day. Okay. Um, like I said at the beginning, I just basically, the, the point of this was to say, hey, uh, Hydra isn't scary. You can use it yourself. You can host it yourself and it's relatively easy to get started. Um, even though digging into like kind of the full customization starts to ramp up uh, pretty quickly, uh, I do think that the like initial user experience of like create a simple job set uh, is absolutely attainable. And so I encourage people to do so, um, either to self-host it or you can use the uh, NGI Zero for like the Summer of Next Participants. Um, or to host it for your own organization. I think that's a, also another viable uh, uh, outcome. Yes, thank you again very much, Tom, for the great presentation and making Hydra less scary for most of us. Um, also, thank you, Matthias, for coming in at the end to ask some questions. Uh, I will be wrapping this up and I will talk to you guys later. Thank you. So, that's the, the end of yet another very insightful lecture series in my end. I hope you guys enjoyed it. I know that I did, like always. <laughs> um, but the next lecture does not yet have a title. It will be announced soon enough. Uh, so keep an eye out for that on, on Discourse and the community calendar. Um, I'm sorry for sounding a little bit like down today. Uh, 
I haven't slept all that much. <laughs> so that's why. Um, but apart from that, yes, once again, thanks to everybody that makes it possible. As I said in the very beginning, that also means you as participant. Um, and also the Anana Foundation, the European Commission, the Nixos Foundation, and Tweak. And yes, I hope to see you next time. See ya.